All right, so we're going to get started, and this is an informal presentation, so we're not going to have to call the meeting to order, or um, so we'll just get started with the first presenter. Now it's on. Okay, hello. Um, each of you should don't that should have a packet in front of you. Um, I find that's the easiest way for me to go over my budget. Um, I always start out with what it, athletics teaches, and you can see that on there. It's the same stuff. I don't need to read it to you. Um, in a recap of the 2018-2019 year, um, we currently are offering 54 teams, 28 of them varsity, 11 JV, and 15 modified. Please note that this does include um, our unified teams as well as our seven, eight, nine teams. Um, it also does include our seven teams that are combined with other school districts. Currently, those school districts are Gowanda, uh, North Collins, as well as the hockey team, which is um, Hamburg, West Seneca East, and West Seneca West. Um, we have three teams that are currently sponsored through private funding. Those would be our hockey team and our two unified teams. Okay, uh, once again, Eden Athletics continues to be successful in many different areas. Girls softball had one division last year. Um, and just a reminder, the reason I recapped the spring is because where this meeting always falls. Uh, girls softball won division in the section uh, B2 title. Girls lacrosse won the section C title, went on to compete in Far West Regionals. Boys lacrosse won their division, competed in the section finals. Girls volleyball this past year won division, won the C1 uh, title, and then also competed in the crossovers. Boys Volleyball won their division, won section title, and also competed at the New York State F, um, State Competition, which was in Albany. Two members of our swim team, one diver, one swimmer, um, Michael's sister, um, competed at swim states at Ithaca. They also, both of them bro broke several records. Uh, girls Basketball just recently won their division uh, for the first time since 2012. We had uh, 11th grade wrestler just compete uh, two weekends ago in Albany at the New York State Championship. And our unified bowling team took second place at their uh, unified championship this past weekend. Um, we, on Monday, we just started our spring season. Varsity and JV teams started all but boys tennis, um, despite the four inches of snow we still have. Um, and then modifieds are slated to start next week. We have a number of athletes, once again, who have signed their national letters of intent, including four new ones today um, to compete at the collegiate level next year. We, I do not have the exact number of how many from the top 10 graduating class, but we are um, holding steady each year between six and seven. Um, we had a number of scholar athletes that were recognized in the fall. The winter ones were, are just being announced. Um, the fall, we saw three volleyball players. Um, one, we had two prep talk winners. So, I mean, that's that's really outstanding that we're, um, our student athletes continue to be top of their class academically, too. Mid-year, one of the things I will pass out later is that uh, we brought in cross-training athletics, building the character athletes from inside out. Actually, I'll pass it out now. Um, if you want to take a look at some of the playbooks, um, and I'll explain on that. Um, so one of the great things that we're introducing this year is that um, not only are we successful athletically, we're also striving to be academically since the um, introduction of the AEP program. We've seen a number of student athletes, um, the number of kids that were academically ineligible has decreased tremendously over the years. So the next part is looking at the character of our athletes to make sure that we are producing uh, great community members upon graduation. So we brought in cross-training athletics. Um, Coach Masters, who runs this program, actually just did a presentation to our uh, uh, spring coaches this past Monday. It was greatly received. I know Mr. Milson is out in the crowd. He was a cross training um, he was a cross training coach this past year and each week uh, Coach Masters comes in 
and teaches uh, basically a 30 minute lesson on a character trait. And then at the end of each week, while the coach is using that character trait in his daily you know, uh, lessons, game plan, all that, coaches will nominate from modified to varsity the athlete that truly represented that, that trait. And then I get the pleasure of picking an athlete uh, of the week and uh, female and male from um, that week will receive this. So each week, I think we had 10 total weeks, we had 10 winners from modified to varsity and they were up on Twitter, they received this Character Athlete of the Week award, it's got to take it home, parents were super excited. Um, we also have, at the end of the season, the team gets to pick, I get to pick, and the coach gets to pick their nominees for the character athlete of their season, and they get this one. Um, outside of the gym, you can see all the kids that were nominated. So even though they weren't technically the winner for the week, they saw that their coach recognized them for that character trait. So that's something I'm really proud in. Um, I've, Sandy has been a great help in that because we are also looking at ways of bringing it into the classroom as well as the entire student body um, to again start taking the character traits and really focusing on making sure not only are our student athletes and students uh, great kids but great characters that I can we can send back out to the community. So Marissa, let me let me ask you a question. So I was at Chictawaka High School today mm -hmm. and I saw the banners hanging. Yep. As I that, took pictures to send yeah, to you. So so what I was told by uh, the athletic director there is that those came with the character program. Yes, so They're that, phenomenal. Yes, so that came with the character program that was based on their um, their classroom. So I, I took a lot of this information from Chictawaga because they actually have a class. They bring Coach Masters in for a class. It's like a ninth grade academy, but he teaches a character class. Um, I think it's once a week. He is a certified teacher, um, but. So they brought it into their curriculum completely. So right now we're focused on the athletic part of it, but starting in September with Sandy's help, we're gonna look at, well actually we're looking at it now, but rolling it out to um, middle school. I think we did, I think we said five through 12. We're working on that. He would do assemblies as well as staff development for the teachers, but um, the character words, sorry, uh, whether it be leadership, spirit, pride, um, teamwork, um, it's their poster size, just excitement. If you walk into Chictawaga, the first thing you see, I took a picture of the rug. I think it said, I have it, I loved it. Hold on, sorry. And, and so and this conversation that much. Marissa and I've been having for three or four years, Marissa, falls into the district goals in terms of character, education, academics, all of that together. So, when you walk into Chictawaga Central, the first thing you see is a big uh, sign that says character, but the rug says where character, curriculum, and community come together. And I just thought that was great. Um, so that's one of the things I'm really proud of. Um, I think it was a good goal for me um, within the athletic program because like I said, we're already, I think we're top notch when it comes to um, the kids that we have participating, the, the booster club um, helping out, uh, the the coaches that I have, um, my goals was to work on the character program as well as increasing participation. And I think it goes hand in hand. So that's one of the steps that we're taking this year. Um, I'll move on to the next page. Um, the reason that um, the next part of my goal is to increase um, participation is because of the benefits of participation in athletics. You do studies show you see an increase in GPA, attendance, discipline, college acceptance, commitment, responsibility, communication, teamwork, accepting of criticism, which is huge for kids going to college as well as in the workplace, um, being accountable. Uh, studies have shown student athletes tend to be more focused and more goal, goal oriented during their sports season leading to better grades and less discipline issues, uh, which I can attest for. Um, student athletes simply have less time to get into trouble. They stay more focused on their academics so that they're not academically ineligible and that they're not um, on that AEP list missing practice time. They have a sense of belonging, uh, provide students with a core group of friends that they can rely on. Uh, research also shows that students who are connected to their school do better academically and behaviorally. They experience failure and adversity, which both of those lead to incredible lifelong opportunities. Kids need to know how to not 
to fail at something and how to pick themselves back up. Have a bad game and it's okay, you got taken out, but how do you recover from that? It's okay. Um, and that's a huge life lesson for kids. Um, students, uh, athletes also gain valuable leadership and communication skills. So if you turn the page, right now our participation rate, um, we have 22 teams in the fall, we're at about 50%. Um, I would like to see this go up, especially in some of the boys' sports. We do, in talking with the coaches, I have some ideas worked out um, for the summer, uh, which would also um, lead to some kids getting interested at a younger age. Uh, winter teams, are we have 14 teams, which do not include, include unified bowling. We're at about 21%. Spring teams from last year, 17, not including unified supposed to be basketball, was at about 44%. And again, um, trying to look at reaching out to some of these kids in the younger grades is what the focus will be from June on with some of the coaches. The coaches have been well receptive to the ideas. Um, if you turn the page, uh, the proposal for next year's budget is pretty standard. You will see an increase in officials. Um, this is different. I had to send this correction into Laura. I don't even know if she's checked her email yet. Um, she probably didn't. Um, you, but that is contractual. It also has to do with a little bit of bringing back a few of those um, programs that we discussed last meeting. Um, supplies stays relatively the same, uh, just a little bit of an increase that goes down with the price of everything goes up. I, we, my coaches are great as far as we go with bare minimum when it comes to supplies. Reconditioning, just so you know, once again, that's for helmets. We're required by law to recondition our football helmets. So we send them out, they get tested, they come back. If they're pass, I don't have to buy any helmets. If they don't pass, which I think we're on a cycle right now where I usually have to purchase six new a year. Um, but again, it's to make sure those helmets, for those that don't know, football helmet, you put it on the head and then you have to pump it up to make sure that it stays and the, head, the kid's head doesn't jiggle around. After about four years, that helmet doesn't take air anymore. So a helmet's worthless. So if it does not pass, it's chucked out, which is what we want. So Marissa, that, that helmet budget doubled from 14, 15 to 15, no, 16. No, if you look under reconditioning. That's the one, I'm sorry, under it's, reconditioning. It's six, it's been six. Um, and the 2014 year, it was three. You yes, see, so if you recall, actually. That was the year they changed the regs, right? They changed some of the regs in 2013. Thank you for pointing that out. They changed the regs in 2013 or 14. And actually what I found out Eden was doing was, um, the state says that you only have to recondition them every two years. Uh, that, I feel, opens us up to a lawsuit. So we went with reconditioning every one year, um, or every year, excuse me. Um, we also, at that time, they banned, um, there's different levels of helmets. There's a one, two, three, four, and five. Most of Eden's helmets at that time were fours and fives, the cheapest you could buy. So we then got rid of all of those got the twos, um, some ones, ma mainly twos, and we went to reconditioning them every year because it's the safest things for our kids. Um, conference and travel is the same. Just a reminder that that's not me going all great places, even though I would love to. That's usually our travel to state competitions um, because for um, when we go to Albany, when we go to um, Long Island for states, we have to pay for the buses and the hotels and stuff. So it's kind of a high number if you didn't know anything, but it's a great thing that our kids make it that far. Um, membership has to do with some of it is um, dues, some of it is golf course, um, our bowling alley um, lanes are in there, so some of it is some uh, different sorts of membership. Um, BOCES relatively stays the same. Laura, I did send you just, mine went up $500 today. Um, it um, is for dues with, to ECIC, dues to Section 6, and then dues to NISFA. We cannot participate in athletics without being members of members in good standings. So those are our dues. So those are things, aidable. And so one of the things that Laura's been really good about explaining is, is that she just simply um, puts that increase in every year knowing that there's going to be an increase. What I noticed at the board meeting this morning for ECIC, they had not been doing that. Right. 
And so I'm hoping that they'll con they will start to do that each year. So you should see a, a, a one or a two percent increase, whatever that board approves each year to account for things that become more expensive each year because otherwise they have to start either making a big jump after a number of years or losing some of the pieces that they've done. It's right. just smart budgeting. Right. And then miscellaneous is always the trainer. Um, we're still, just so everybody knows, we're in the last year of our grant with the trainer, so RFPs are going out um, to see what we can do for our trainer. My hope was that uh, the NFL would come out with another grant again. They haven't just yet, um, so we're still trying to hope to keep our training hours. We're at full time right now. Um, 25,000 is really like a part time trainer. Um, and again, this is not a physical fitness trainer. This is our athletic trainer, our ATC certified trainer. Um, so we're still working on that, but my hopes is to keep it at the 25,000. Um, if you go to the next page, it's everything I just explained. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, the coaches, myself, we've been very diligent on managing our roster sizes. Um, if you noticed in the previous uh, couple pages, we had more modified teams than we did JV teams. And this is we, because we found that um, it was better, safer, and more fiscally responsible for us to run a 789 program, cancel the JV, and then run a varsity program. We did this in field hockey, we did this in girls soccer, and we did this in um, football. And it was the right move to make. We will continue to monitor our um, participation rate as well um, with certain other sports that we're seeing a decline in participation with. I do not foresee anything um, for next year, but I am keeping my eye on three programs that I would like to keep to myself right now, just so people don't flip out on me. I think, though, <laughs> if, um, if it gets put up, Lucinda would know the best that we have stabilized our enrollment mm -hmm. at 9, 10, 11, 12, probably 7, 8, 9, 10, right. 11, 12, which is why you were seeing some decreases, but you're probably not right. going to see it as much right now. So we're no longer in a declining enrollment mode right. at Eden, which is also a great yay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and lastly, we'll continue to keep talking with neighboring districts. One of the best things I think we ever did was merge with North Collins. We do actually reach out to North Collins um, for a number of sports. Um, and, and, and credit to North Collins, they're still trying to maintain some of their own identity. So there's programs that they're a little reluctant on. Um, I will tell you that we have a number of North Collins parents that are always um, overstepping or um, pretty much skipping over calling North Collins and just calling Eden um, to merge, but we can't do that without North Collins. So we'll continue to look at that though because it does bring a little bit of revenue in. Um, and lastly, um, and I hate to add this, but I just may, need to make sure people know that if for some reason somebody ever won the lottery and wanted to give money back, or if for some reason we ended up with a surplus, um, the areas that we would be looking in this spe uh, sp specific order would be a definite repair and replacement of the tennis courts. You can see my foot on um, the equator that's going through three of the tennis courts currently. Um, we, I think, have come up with a way to patch it, um, hopefully, for the spring. Um, tennis court is not cheap. Um, our last quote was to patch it was like 30,000 um, companies, and that's with Dave's crew doing the work themselves because no company will come out to patch it because they said it won't work and they won't put their name to it. Um, so when we started the capital project, it was like a $300,000 repair. It was <coughs> higher. So I just need people to know because, um, yeah. So because we're in a bowl, <laughs> a, a water reservoir bowl, right. in order to do anything with that tennis court that's more than just a simple patch and repair, you have to fix the drainage underneath right. it. We've done a lot of drainage work in this capital project though. So it's smarter for us to monitor it and see yep. how the how the drainage improvements that we've made um, all the way down from Jennings all the way through the front of the Sorry. building into the back make a difference for us. Part of the problem though is what you're seeing in this crack is an improvement in our drainage and the rest of, right. of the property, which is also drawing it out a little and causing it to crack a little bit more. And Preshel and I were gonna start the garden club at the high school right there, yeah. but we decided not to this year. Um, 
the next would be the replacement of the pool diving board and replacement of the pool starting box. That's another complicated one that unfortunately it sounds a lot easier than what it is, but because our what we're finding is because our pool, um, so it's not as simple of, hey, Marissa, I'm gonna give you money and replace it. I wish that it was that easy, but because our pool is um, old and um, uh, not as deep as uh, the new pools, regulations have changed. So we're still trying, we're looking into possible ways to replace maybe just the diving board itself, but we're running into problems there as well. So um, it is something we continue to look into, but we also are finding that companies are saying they can't install in um, this depth of a pool as well. So it is one that I'm continuing uh, to research on. Corey from Young and Wright has been great of sending me information from different companies. So him and I have been going back and forth with that. Um, and uh, again, the only other one would be purchase of modified team uniforms. I'm finding that I think our modified kids were a lot bigger years ago, where now our modified kids are tiny. So they're the uniforms don't fit. And the way that uniforms work out is it trickles down. So I have a number of um, modified teams that I would be looking for uniforms and then funding of the non-league contest. But again, it's three huge ones and two little ones. Um, and then lastly is a great picture of the additions that you guys allowed to happen. Um, our stadium looks outstanding. Um, it's just super exciting and I included some pictures at the end of, I just wanna thank you, the board, um, for allowing me to do this job and do it to the best of my ability because you have not stood in my way at all and I think we have done a great job thus far um, and we're giving kids everything they absolutely deserve and I couldn't do it without the support of this board so I thank you for that. And now I will stop talking unless somebody has questions. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a PowerPoint. Just give me two seconds to pull it up. So, so while Lucinda is setting up, um, there, there's chatter today that we um, won't have four feet of snow in March on our turf field. Right. So what is your hope up there? Um, it, the lacrosse is ready to go. My coaches are excellent, and we had our meeting on um, Monday, and we have a schedule. We have a schedule built. We have a gym schedule, which kids are in until 10 o'clock tonight, every night. Um, we also have the lacrosse turf schedule ready to go. So I know that if it if it rains and heats up a little bit, there's gonna be no there's gonna be no snow out there and the lacrosse coaches will be out as soon as that happens. We are slated to start um, games and boosters has not received that schedule yet because uh, the boys' schedule was not correct. So we made changes just as of today and that has been finalized, but we are actually slated to start games in the next two and a half weeks for boys lacrosse. So the 19th isn't a starting date? <laughs> so this might not be your call, but to expedite the snow melting process, um, maybe taking that tractor that's in there and just driving it with wheels will expedite the melting process. I'm to drive that, they've been keeping me away from it. Just, you should go see if it starts. You have a key. <laughs> I do have a key. Um, our hope is, and that was the nice thing with having Hilbert too, um, Hilbert has been renting our facility um, and they don't mind playing in a couple of inches of snow and with them forcing on there, it was actually nice They before the last snowfall. Um, but our hope, I know in talking to Chris Archibald on Monday, his hope is to be out there next week, Monday, Tuesday. Um, Right. As soon as it melts, we should be good to go. Um, I'm just saying, uh, someone takes a drive tomorrow with a tractor up and down, just puts a couple of ruts in the snow, it will 
really expedite the melting process of the snow. I'm you need, my you need to get coat it exposed. Tomorrow. <laughs> I always like fresh air. Okay. Great. Good evening. Um, I am going to talk about the technology proposed budget. And I was listening to Marissa uh, talk about all the accolades of her department, which congratulations, Marissa. Um, I did want to tell you, this is uh, year three of our four-year rollout of one-to-one. -one, and it's t I could talk all night about that. But to really give it in depth, I'm actually supposed to present on technology at the next board meeting. And I've asked the sixth grade team to come and show you what they're doing. So I think that would be uh, more beneficial for you to see what's happening with the power of one-to-one -one in the classroom. So tonight, I am going to talk about the technology proposed budget. And I'm also going to say, Mrs. Feldman, just you know, hang on. Because I'm saying proposed because I think all of you that were on the board last year, remember I got up here and said, yay, look at my budget. I really didn't go up. And if you just keep at me at that number or whatever I'm going to be like okay and everything and the next day they cut my budget but anyway so I just need to put that out there I'm going to focus on a couple lines that are highlighted or where we have had movement this year but I did want to put that out there I am fully knowledgeable that in the next few weeks if things need to be cut that one of the main things that we're going to be looking at is the hardware equipment line and um, I'll explain more about that in a second but I did want to tell you a little bit about the one-to-one -one, how it affects my team and um, as of all of you know, that this year with the th year three, here at the elementary school in th grades three, four, and five, they got class sets. So there's enough one-to-one -one devices, but they stay in the classroom. In grades six, seven, eight, and nine, which was a surprise because of the wonderful pricing we got in the summer, we were able to roll out one-to-one -one at the middle school and high school in grade nine for the kids to take homes. But what does that mean dollars and cents wise? So I asked my team to put together some numbers. Um, of the 431 assigned student devices, 259 are insured by the parents for accidental damage. So far this year, we've had six claims have been made for repairs covered by insurance. Three repairs have been made in-house because of the device was not covered by insurance. And the cost has been billed to the students, two of them for $180 a piece and one of them for $20. Seven repairs were made in-house at our expense because the device was out of warranty and the repair would not be covered by the insurance. These were things like replacing keyboards, bad motherboard, misaligned hinges. Seventeen devices had batteries replaced in-house at our expense. Batteries are not covered by the insurance. So you're going to say, Lucinda, how is that? And I said, I actually think all in all from what I was kind of told ahead of time by some other of our other consortium members, this was pretty good we planned for a little worse, okay? That said, if you look at my budget, I know Mrs. Um, Feldman handed out to you, uh, you'll see that there's several lines, like my repair lines or whatever. If you go back years, I haven't increased repair lines in very much. We've held the line. I know Mrs. Gage is sitting in the audience, but we're spending it, guys, okay? Um, as we go forward, and I'm talking about the equipment line right now, um, the first focus that we have when I put together the budget is the replace part and the rotation part. Um, one of the notes down there is that some of the equipment doesn't fall into that six-year uh, uh, you know, New York State recommended replacement. That is Chromebooks. <laughs> they sometimes have a three or four-year life span. So that's kind of scary. Um, so our first focus when I put the budget together in the equipment line is to stay on our rotation plan and stay where we need to be. Um, I think I expressed last year that with the one-to-one, -one, we were able to eliminate some of our existing technology. This past year, we used to have two stationary Mac labs that teachers could sign out throughout the day, one near the library and one near the technology wing. Because of the Chromebooks being in, you know, four grade levels, right, three, four grade levels, that we didn't need that second lab. So what was wonderful is poor Mr. Jones has been dying to expand his CAD lab, which was in a regular size classroom. We eliminated the Mac technology lab this year and moved the CAD lab over there and was able to give him a few more machines. So he's now got full size classes and he actually has a double classroom. He's got the room next door, which used to be the learning lab, where he's got his actual drawing tables. And in the room next to that is now this CAD labs with all of his full 25 CAD machines. So that same thing is going to happen next year. I'm retiring some um, iPad uh, carts that we had. They don't, we don't need them. We've got touch screen uh, Chromebooks. We do need still have some, like this right now, Mrs. Milkowski is borrowing one of the ones we have because they're doing an iMovie project. 
Um, I'm still going to keep the library computer lab because it's right across the hall from Mrs. Braun's art class and she does the photography class and they go in there and do Photoshop. Things that can't be done on Chromebooks. We have to remember that Chromebooks are the lower end. They do, they do have some limitations. So I won't be able to always get rid of everything that we had before, but we will be able to you know, eliminate. And that's why, I know Mrs. Feldman and I meet, why I'm able to stay within that budget that I've had the last couple of years and now next year buy three grade levels of, of devices because I'm not replacing everything that's up to be replaced. Does that make and sense? The re and the repurposing is really, really it's sweet. It's I mean, it's I don't it's know it's that we really could have planned it no. out loud yeah. as to the way it all turned out. Mm -hmm. So that said, um, I did put a note on there that the plan for next year for new for grade levels will be grades 10, 11, and 12 to be getting Chromebooks. But truthfully, what's going to happen is that six, seven, eight, nine are going to hand theirs in at the end of the year. We're going to inventory them, take a you know, look, update them, clean them over the summer, and we're going to give them back to the same students. So grades seven through 10, oops, sorry, are going to get their Chromebooks back. So actually I'm buying for 11, 12, and six. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So Mrs. Feldman and I talked and she's like, well, what happens if I have to cut this budget? Um, what happens is I really think that we should focus on focus two go we've promised the community we've been full board ahead I would take a really deep look at what machines we could possibly push another year um, but if she tells me Lucinda can I cut I'm just gonna say a number don't hold $20,000 I'm gonna say yeah but I probably remember that repair line that I said I'm already maxing out if I'm pushing equipment farther than it's supposed to go I might need a little bit more there, so it, it might need to balance. So, this, so I'm just saying, if they come back and say, Lucinda, w what's going on here? So, so. so what I'm trying to point out here now is <laughs> you are eloquently explaining the need for this district to adopt a technology reserve plan okay. so that we can save money to put it forward so that your replacement plan, you will not be band-aiding <laughs> older stuff. You will have the correct technology for the students as we're getting into the smart schools where we had the wonderful gift from New York State, mm -hmm. but we have to replace it on our own. Yes. Lucinda, let me ask you a question. Sure. Does, does this award of the smart school bond today use up all of our smart school bond funding? No, it does not. Because we pulled the <laughs> phones out. Yes, we did. So right. we should have about $200,000 left. And uh, Laura, I did check with uh, Michelle Oko, who is the BOCES rep there, and I said, we're hearing that I can't use it for equipment that I've already bought if down the road. And she was going to check on me, but she got back. She, I think I might be able to use it. So I might be able to use a little bit. So, so knowing that we saved it by having to spend it on the phone project, we've got about 200000 there that we need to take a good look at. That said, if you look down farther, there's a state line that I have um, that's called hardware, instructional hardware. I don't know if I say what it's on there. It's called, yeah, um, there. Like yeah, that, that one line there, um, we will, Unbelievably, we need to start next year. We are starting to replace smart, uh, smart boards. They're already aging out. So um, that line is pretty much where I'm replacing the smart boards. And that, that is a state line that we're giving per student numbers. So that helps out that way. But that's, that's pretty much what I'm replacing in that line. And, and has the technology for, for, for those boards come along? Yes. A lot. Yes, yes. Um, pretty much the smart boards I'm just putting into primary our elementary buildings, a few special ed up at the high school, but every place else I'm eliminating projectors and putting in the interactive flat screen, similar to the one you see in the district office. Um, those, they're much cheaper. They're about half the price or less. Um, and and the, yeah, the bulbs go away, the, the, all that extra, it's one piece of equipment. They're half the price of a smart, uh, smart board. And up at the high school level, they can use smart notebook on it, which is like, I, ca I kind of call it like smart uh, board light, you know, um, so the things that they would need at the high school. And then the clarity to show things like, you know, movies and it's just beautiful. I mean, it's like, it's like your best big screen, flat screen. So um, the teachers have been happy. And as of this year, we're all out. <laughs> but now next year, right away, we start having to recycle. This is kind of our lives, you know, so, so it's finally all in there. So um, any other questions about my equipment? Again, it, if you notice, I actually saved a little money this year. <laughs> it's actually, the, that's why it's down a little bit, almost $2,000. So what, just with what we need, but it's, it's a big number, I know. And I also know that that's a number we may have to adjust. So, okay. I do want to ask a quick question. Sure, sure. So when you have a giant item, like a smart board, and uh -huh. you're 
getting rid of it what what is exactly does that entail like is it I have to recycle re I have to okay. recycle it with an approved recycler that okay. I usually get through BOCES because they have to meet OSHA requirements so yeah okay so yes we um, on the plus side what did we how much did we get back on our last one we, we just made some money in our last recycling didn't we mrs. Gage not to put you on because they pay us for parts in it so it's like when I put a whole pallet in there we get charged for some and we get it back most of the time it's close to wash but I want to say it was almost a thousand dollars today right we got back we're like yay but it goes to the general fund so <laughs> so yeah so we do sometimes we make money too so but a good question any other questions on equipment all right the other line I want to talk to you about is software um, Mrs. Feldman let me raise that up from 40,000 to 42,000 this year but I want to review where we've been and you'll hear my my concern about this line is that you know year one we rolled out to the GLP pilot teachers year two was GLP and the sixth grade all all in okay so now remember Mrs. LaRosa's talking a couple while a little bit ago one-to-one -one is completely changing the way teachers are teaching we need to train these teachers it's it's a different classroom it should look different when they go in there and giving them the devices is not enough it's got to have the software or what I say I buy very little software anymore I buy subscriptions they charge me yearly they go up yearly so I can't even buy what I had last year for the 40,000 or right away just to com completely buy what I had this year was probably up to the 42 so that means nothing new well this is kind of one of those unintended consequences it was kind of an aha moment when we were putting the budget together this year when you look at the way this rolled out so GLP pilot teachers got them trained got them going got the iPads going the iPad minis the sixth grade teachers which are going to come present they're, they're on a pretty good roll here they're going um, this year we got the elementary teachers and the middle school all in we're trying to get them trained we're trying to get them out um, like mrs. Uh, Bernie who's the department chair for science since we can't get teachers out they're actually asking teachers to come in they had a teacher that's uh, been using one-to-one uh, -one devices in North Collins come and work with her her team today or yesterday so um, we're getting them trained and they're going out and they're finding these things but I'm running out of money and you're going to you can see what happens here is we're very heavy on software and subscriptions at the lower levels and next year I'm handing it out to 10 11 and 12 and those teachers are just getting their feet wet and we're running out of money so just to give it in perspective for request I have sixty one thousand dollars worth of requests and I have forty two thousand dollars so Kelly and I are going to be working we're, we're putting out a second survey to say who's really using it if you're not using it every day something you might have had for a subscription for five six years now we're going to probably look at cutting it because we need to be able to make this more balanced does this make sense but again I just wanted to let you know where a concern is that you know I don't want to shortchange the upper levels just because they were the last ones on this rollout does that make sense and the other thing that happens with this whole culture change is SED has allowed us to utilize textbook soft aid mm -hmm. in order to purchase software, but we're not quite there and ready to roll that out, is my understanding from Mrs. LaRosa. Right. So as things go in the future, that may be the part of the solution is using the money that we get per student for textbooks into some of these software subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And there's a third wrinkle. So a lot of these teachers are being real scrappers they are going out and getting free stuff okay so it is great but we hit the wall about two two weeks ago now mrs feldman three weeks ago what they don't realize is when they sign up and they put in their school district or whatever some of these free apps that are good i mean they because they're really they're giving value back we're putting kids actual work up there whatever we hit a threshold of like a capacity limit and they basically held us hostage till i paid them and now we have a subscription but on the other hand, too, SED just passed all of their regulations about students' confidential information, you know, their personal identifiable information. Even so if it's slow down and start that one over, I, okay. you switch to topic, and it's I know. a really important it's topic. It's really important, okay. right. Brand new in January, uh, the Board of Regents is adopting a much stricter regulations for sharing with third-party vendors, whether you have a contract with, with a dollar amount to it or it's a contract from that you're doing something free whatever that you're doing anything that you are sharing students personal identifiable information we have to have written contracts that are very specific about 
that they're not going to share this, that they're not going to sell their information, that they have got, I've got to have a lot of information about how they're keeping that information secure. What kind of security do they have on their equipment? So, so. if we back up on that, let's go back how mm -hmm. many years? Three, four years when yes. the dashboard came out mm -hmm. and the parents and the communities were very concerned about breaches. Mm -hmm. And so a task force was developed by the Board of Regents and this is the result of that task force by the Board of Regents to protect our students. Yes. Okay. And they just hired a new, um, like a chief information officer for uh, for security, they, it took them over a year to find the right person, and that person's been working for about almost a year to be able to come up with these new policies that they're going to be adopting. That we have to be compliant by December first. So now here are the other twist. Hold, Where the hey, twi hold I, your twist for I a moment. Sure. Laura's yeah. got a good point to put in. Uh, so as we go to these contracts that are legal documents that we have to protect students' identity and we can all, and the companies will try to tell us what's best for them. We have to now run those through legal and pay legal fees to have those vetted for every single software out there to make sure that we're in compliance so that we're doing the best we can to protect the students' information. Which, by the way, you see I don't have legal on there because I've never really had to. This is going to mean that I'm going to be spilling into legal, which I've never had to do. So that again, what I was just going to, my, my twist back is where I have been pushing teachers to go find that free stuff and see if you really like it, now I have to say, hang on, you, you really can't be doing anything that shares student information. So then you think about it, if you look at your little apps or your games in the app store or whatever, the stuff that you can't put and get you know, interactive stuff or put on an account and make something with your name in it or whatever of some sort is not as robust a piece of device. To, the, the teachers aren't going to be interested. So you see why I'm concerned about software. I guess I wanted to talk about my concerns. Um, it's a line that's just kind of creeping up and I, like I said, an unintended consequence with getting them the devices. We were also like, we got to get the more expensive devices, but we need to give them things to um, use those devices for. So. I know, but I'm just saying, I think it, it just kind of snuck up on me a little bit, too. Well, you know, it's like, I, I think, work. too, that it's, it's worth stating is, is that so many other districts were so far ahead of us with technology that their, their jump wasn't so big. Right. We, we were so far behind in our server capacity that we, we, we didn't purchase so no. much. And so what you're seeing here is that initial jump coming back to trying to level out the budget with the reserve on technology. Okay. We went through this a couple of years ago with the buses as well. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, any additional questions on software? Okay, all right, so Laura and I flipped a coin and I do have to talk about these two budget lines. As she wanted to remind me to remind everybody, they really aren't my budget lines, I just manage them. And they're a little out of control this year and I wanted to explain why. First off, there's the general cost of living increase that exists on the service, existing services. Um, and I just gave a couple. Most every single thing that we have, and if you see my actual detail, it's, it's huge. We must have 45 things in there that we have different services in, in that one line, and the 1680 line. Um, and they m might go up minimally, like our Microsoft li license for the district of $243, or our automation systems for all three of our libraries went up four thousand um, dollars. You know, IP Direct, Sean, which we talked about, they they restructured the way they bill things and included something that we don't want, but they're including it. So that went up almost two thousand um, dollars. Network security, that's the filter that goes on everybody's computers, including all of our students, is going up almost four thousand dollars. So um, those are just general increases. Then so I'll, so okay. just think, sure. yeah. if in fact we have a legal increase, mm -hmm. they probably do as well. Absolutely, right. they really do. And, that, and they're, they're also in the same boat I am. And another reason I say this is my proposed budget, um, as I tell Laura, I will color in the lines that you guys set for my budget, but the reality is right now what we're doing is getting estimated quotes for everything. Until I go to place those actual orders in the summer, I don't know what my actual costs are. Sometimes we luck out and in August they run some great specials, which is why I might have a little money to get something that we didn't plan on, like in the software line. Um, or the ninth grade uh, Chromebooks, right. Sometimes they run specials, sometimes they don't. And that's the other part about my BOCES lines that um, Laura and I kind of go crazy is they're in the same boat. Like right now I'm gonna tell you the Microsoft or Adobe, until they get their actual bill 
our bills go up and down too. I'm, I'm constantly like, this is where we think it is, but they're, they're dealing with vendors too. So once they get their actual numbers with how many districts buy in and how many, it, it's all based on the quantity, so. And one thing I wanna point out to the board is as Lynn, Lucinda is taking things to the BOCES coasters, mm -hmm. she is generating state aid for the following year on it. So while it's hard to start something new or an increased cost in one year, we do get some aid back on it in the next year, which increases yes, our money from New York State. Mm -hmm. Which is a good example. Um, when you look at the new services we, we did here, um, Master Library, we actually bought into that the year before, and then BOCI started to offer it as a coaster. This year, this is, this is an odd one, this year it actually cost us a little more to join in because there's like a startup fee, but next year it's gonna be a wash and then we also get state aid back on. So it was like a no-brainer if you looked at the long term to switch over and do it through BOCES to get the state aid. So that's why some of those things. But we did increase, um, the PA system will be tied into our VoIP, so that's gonna raise our VoIP uh, system. Uh, uh, applicant tracker, board docs, you guys know, just in time scanning is we are now doing our um, region scanning in house instead of sending them out to BOCES. So um, a little bit more because we had to buy a, a device, a, a, a secure scanner, and then the Z spaces. But I did want to explain BOCES as best as I could why those numbers went up a lot. So, Lucinda, <laughs> if we just back up for a second, sure. applicant tracker allows us to pool applicants for especially our teaching staff from all over Western New York, as opposed to paying $400 to put an ad into the Buffalo News. So, and most teachers use that. Board Docs is what you use. Master Library is the electronic version of the community and the teachers being able to use our facilities. Raptor is your security system at the front doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any questions on BOCES? Like I said, it's kind of is what it is. Okay, so I'm following kind of Marissa's here. This is not in the budget, but I know from listening to the last couple presentations, you guys have asked like concerns, questions, or whatever. So besides software, my other concern is um, the technology integrator. It's a position we've had in the past, and at budget time, again, it's one of those that goes and says it goes, it goes away. Um, and as Mrs. LaRosa pointed out, we are struggling to get our teachers trained. Uh, we belong in BOCES to CSLO. I had three trainings, I think, scheduled this year um, for a BOCES trainer to come in and work with like, particularly the third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers on their new one-to-one and, -one, and had to cancel two of them because we couldn't get the subs to cover so they could be trained. And those subs are paid by the coaster so it was like it wasn't even about the money it was just about getting the bodies here to do it so we're really just struggling to get them in here um, they're coming up with great ideas like mrs. Bernie to bringing people in after hours they're, they're, they're getting themselves trained and as much as they can but to be able to have a technology coach I was just at the digital pathways conference at Erie one on Monday and the, they highlighted uh, schools that are doing it very well, you know, and so many of them had these coaches, instructional technologies that could walk in and work with teachers and stay with them and help them or help them figure out how to transform those classrooms. And um, again, we've previously had one right now. Um, this year I have Mr. Uh, Pearson two periods a day for this, so the 80 minutes. I have Mr. Neal um, a period one day and two periods like every other day. Um, and they are kind of buried with the one-to-one. -one. Um, they've been making videos so they could put them out there for the teachers, but that's not the same as being able to go in and be and meet with a teacher and be in there one-to-one. -one. Um, I know there's not enough money in this budget, but again, you guys say, where, where would you like to see Lucinda? Kind of, uh, I really think, if we, yeah, if we won that lottery, um, it just to be able to have a person that could give in-district support to our teachers as they go through this, you know, in the next few years, I think it might be a solution since we are having such a sub, -tru sub, sub trouble. So, anyway, that's kind of my presentation tonight. Unless you had any other questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Oh boy, save the best for last, right? <laughs> um, I know Mrs. Feldman gave you a copy of the budget, but I want to kind of, when I was thinking about that, we were going through some um, data. So that's that orange sheet I gave you. Um, I guess I finally realized why, oh my gosh, things have gotten a little bit crazy in the PPS department. If you look down at, 
the data, I, I guess we uh, highlighted at the bottom, this just blew me away. And I wondered, because I just started annual reviews last week, that I, 368 students within our district are receiving some sort of special ed support service. That's 26%. And then I wondered to myself, no wonder I'm, I'm, like, I, I'm sitting, I am chairing 368 meetings. I'm like, no wonder nothing else is getting done. And I didn't really know till we really started putting the numbers down here, because we're just doing it. We're doing it, we're doing it. And I thought it was just interesting. So you could see some facts there of um, under CSE, there's 239 students. Uh, like I've told people, I've been here 14 years and started my 14th year. When I started, we had 110. Um, so within 14 years, we're up to 239. That's your K through 12. Sean, how do you compare that to other districts around here? Well, you know what's interesting? I don't, I don't know how to compare it because I don't have time to really find out. Everybody, everybody's numbers are out, uh, are up. They are. It just seems like ours, and we've we've talked about that. I know Cheryl brought it up last time. We're we're good, and so we. If you look at the transfers, there's big numbers. So I don't really know. Um, yeah, everybody's struggling. There's no doubt about it, you know, on that part. So I think what was interesting to me, I think the biggest thing that's interesting, and it's down in here, that I have 42 three- and four-year-olds that are receiving services under CPSC. Okay, one class of kindergartners is, what, 79, 80 kids? 42. So that was surprising. I just wanted you to just kind of get a look at our numbers. Um, in your know, BOCES students, it's about average, about 13 students in BOCES. The private placements have gone up big time. That's Randolph, Falk, Summit, Center for Handicapped Children. We have kids all over Western New York. Our buses are going all over. Um, so that was interesting. Another thing that has really hit my budget and hit our program is the amount of students that increased this year that needs nursing on the buses. So I currently have three different bus runs going with three different nurses to get students to their placements. That, that's huge, that's huge, because then I'm trying to juggle having enough in the building and then we contract out and so it's been very interesting on that part of managing that, that end of it. Um, students from other districts, there are eight other districts paying us tuition, so I would thought you'd see that. Next year we're picking up two more, so we'll have 10, Springville and Who's the other one? Orchard Park is sending another student to us. Um, 504 students, 69 of them throughout the district. That's that's a lot. That's a lot, if anybody understands it. So um, so anyways, I just kind of wanted to give you that little information. The back page, you can see the transfers into the buildings that have IEPs. GLP had three transfers. Um, elementary had two. Then we also put the referrals. So then there's still referrals coming in. Testing, testing, testing from parents. IST teams, middle and high school, we had six transfers come in and then the added district. So I just thought that was pretty interesting data. Now surprisingly, when you look at my budget, it's a shocker that it went up $135,000, but I'm gonna explain, there's only, there's only two areas that it did, and I think it's very interesting, you'll understand that. If you look where it says other handicapping services, last year was budgeted at $32,000. Well, that's where we contract for OT and PT. Well, the reason you look at my proposed budget, which is 105, last year um, we had our own OT who passed away. So his salary was in the general fund, so you don't see it here. So it's kind of almost a wash on that end of it. So then I put everything in to that line for the upcoming year. So right now, this year, we have one full-time and two part-time OTs that I contract through Associated PT Associates, whatever it is, um, servicing our kids. Next year, by cont contractual for CSEA, I have to post it. I have to try to hire. I couldn't hire one this summer. We couldn't find one. Um, so we'll do it again and try to find another 1.5 OT. If that's the case, this number goes down. It, Laura, you got to We just place. move it over we into it salaries. Right yeah, yeah. So it doesn't really go away. It just transfers. It looks better then. But I still need the people to service our kids. And I just got to find them that way. So that's why that difference. The other increase at $62,650 is tuition to all other. That's our private placements. We've had um, 
enormous amount of kids, and which is interesting that Jen, you started talking to me, that had significant issues and different needs that went out to like Randolph and some other placements. Center for Handicapped Children, I have two children out there in Amherst, and those are kids that are medically fragile. So, you know, things have changed on that part. So that's it. I mean, really everything else is kind of, look at my BOCES budget. I went down. I was impressed with that, which I, blows me away because in December we had two students move in that were BOCES, and, but they will be graduating. One of Sean, them, so. can you talk about the three and four-year-olds? Because I don't know that it's general knowledge that we also are responsible for students who are yeah, three and yeah. four. So, in special ed world, we are responsible for any student from three to 21. And the three-year-olds are um, typically, we get them from early intervention, which is birth to two, they've gotten services or whatever, they still need and they transition in. Or I pick a lot of them up in our um, pre-K program, a GLP, but we have to provide services for three and four-year-olds. Now, the district doesn't pay a dime for it. It's all county money. But I'm the middleman, so I have to do get the evaluations, do the meetings, get the services, but we don't pay anything. You guys approve it. It doesn't cost us anything. Do they but pay you the same year? I We don't get paid. It's all through the county. I don't see a dime. We don't stack it. We don't do anything. We stack it to the county, Erie County, and Jen, you know, you used to work CPSC, and then the agencies are the ones that get the money. We just do all the legwork. We don't get a dime for it. Um, and then they'll transition into kindergarten and then we start getting the money from that way. But a lot of the kids that are three and four year olds, I would say about 60% of them, it's usually speech, you know, and I'm all about early intervention. I try to get them fixed before they come. So I'm huge, and they know our district is huge on this, of giving them services. A lot of other districts put up roadblocks for those three and four year olds. I will not do that. As long as I'm here, I won't because they, need to start young and get those services. So, uh, but I just was surprised how many numbers. And we have little ones in programs all over the place too. And they're being bused through the county, um, whatever contractual bus services they're using. So I have little three and four year olds on buses going to programs too, that are eating students. Um, so that, the, the budget there I just wanna show you wasn't too bad. Um, what you don't see, Laura, and I didn't, I didn't see this on here, is I also manage all the student health budget, so the nurses. Sorry, forgot about that one. That's okay. I just want to let them know it didn't go up, so that was a good thing. Um, and then our um, district doctor falls under us, and boy, I settled that contract a long time ago, and they haven't charged us more, and we've kept it quiet, and it works out great with Dr. Calkins. So um, those are the other budgets there. And the other thing you don't see, too, is summer school budget. We don't put that up either, because we get a lot of that back or whatever. But we, you know, we have about 17 kids again this summer that's going to get services, three classrooms, and we're going back to North Collins to do it too. So, and so you know, the state pays 80% mm -hmm. of the cost of summer school. So, plus a lot of the kids in our summer school program are the other districts, so they're paying for it. So we're doing good on that one, on that part. So that's that's it. We still have 45, 47 staff mem members under our uh, PPS office. I'm not asking for a staff increase, but I don't have any pictures or anything, but I'm gonna tell you what I do need. Um, and I'm trying to be creative to do this. With 368 students and having to chair their meetings, something's gotta give. And that's, it, some of you know that um, I might be, I'll be leaving next year. So I've been trying to think of some sort of transition and trying to think of, what I could do to get some support in my office to help manage the CSE, CPSEN, because my two school psychologists are testing, and we are so behind. So I'm trying to be creative. Mrs. Feldman knows about this, how I'm trying to figure out um, with my current staff how I can maybe either get a TOSA, a quarter of a time or a part-time to help maybe chair some of these meetings, support some of these meetings. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking. I'm not increasing my budget by staff by any means, utilizing the staff I have and seeing if I can get some, combining some classrooms, you know, that only have two students. Well, could we put it with this one? So I'm just gonna let you know I might come back and say, hey, I found it. Could we approve this TOSA part-time to, so there's gotta be some sort of transition next year when I'm leaving 368 families with some things. So I'm trying to help the district and help the kids and give them, you know, the support and the attention the families need, so. Shonda says not use the word retirement, but that's what she means. 
Oh, Sean, I do have a question for you. Yeah. Can you just, for general knowledge, uh, there's a new group home that went up on Jennings. Can you just talk briefly? Oh, I was going to bring that up. About and what I'll bring our up your other things are. Yeah, she just yelled something in my ear too. Interesting that you brought that up. Um, I did get a phone call today. So the one that on Jennings Road, I have a student coming in because I am responsible from anybody from 18 to 21. This uh, group homes we have another student in another group home. We've had several in the group home. So I just got a phone call today. I think they're moving in end of March, beginning of April. Um, which, thank God, I already have a run going out to that school. And so <laughs> that would have been another so, bus run. So the clients that are moving into that group home mostly have autism. Autism. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And which that's is the program something that the we fought really hard for a couple of years ago. So mm -hmm. I was glad to hear that from you. And yeah. what is the district's responsibility oh, when, I have, when I a have student to, or when a, a client lives at that group home? Yeah. When they live at that group home, they're my CSE responsibility. So they become our responsibility to place them in a program, to transport them, to pay for their education. We get 100 percent reimbursement has a whole different stacking system so it we get all reimbursed for the following it. year mm -hmm. but I got to do but there's, there's a, the uh, resident going in there is in a program already and I actually have a student in that program so we have a bus already going there so it will be great it will be a good transition for us and for the family because it, you know it's a hard thing the family's putting their child into a group home and so I want to make it a smooth transition for them um, coming in from another district and then, oh, last thing, we, and this is a big help on your part because she's all into this, built a sensory room, I call it a chill out room, at the high, uh, middle high school. It is so cool. Um, Marissa did a lot to help with um, teamwork. with teamwork with Jen and um, my Carrie Arrow School psychologist, Michelle Falakitas, and it is utilized by our OT, our PT, and our kids, and it is really kind of cool. I mean, we've had one in every building. Now we have right, it there. Right, now we have one in every building. And when when Sean's kids uh, <coughs> came from the elementary school, they were used to the sensory room here. And they didn't have anything at the high school. So we were able to make shift and put together stuff with teamwork. And it's a really neat room. We kind of call it a chill out room because mm -hmm. they're older. They're that older. One. Yeah. But so I'm really, nice. really. That was really cool, and it was yep. a lot of work, and I thank you giving her leftover mats and stuff <laughs> like that, so it was great. Um, so I think that's my story. Um, I think that anybody have any questions? I do. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, can you, just for the 504 plans, those are just students. You're, they're not related service students. They're not, they're just students. No, they're good. Some are related Some services. are related mm -hmm. services. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mostly um, OT, not speech. Okay. Yeah. So those are, but there would also be like modifications mm -hmm. and, okay. Accommodations for the classroom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because of medical diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm um, just for the, the line, the other, the, the one where you talk about the contract for OTPT. Oh, other handicapping Yeah, thank you. I yeah. can remember yeah. what the HC stood for. Yeah. Can you just explain, because I know some districts use BOCES for their OTPT versus contracting. Paul, don't yell at me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious if there's a financial difference? Or yes, there's a huge okay. financial dis dif difference. Um, I have used BOCES in the past when I needed speech because we just didn't have enough mm -hmm. and they were able to. Um, I did the, we had to do the, what do you call that, R, with the bids. R mm -hmm. R yeah. RFP. Years ago for this when we needed it. Um, but, I mean, contractually, I can't really do this. I have to try to hire our own. I have tried for... Because an OTPT is in the CSEA contract. Yeah, OTPT. Mm -hmm. She's obligated first to try to fill it within the contract. And yeah. I have tried, I would say, probably 11, 12 years trying to hire PT and nobody wants our job. You know, so I contract. Mm -hmm. So um, it is... It is less money than BOCES. Okay. Can, can I interrupt too? Yeah. When it comes to the special education realm and BOCES, the aid is not the same as it is for other BOCES services, okay. which are meant to draw districts together. When it comes to a special education student, it comes back down to it's the excess cost aid formulas again. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the same reimbursement program as you have for other BOCES services, so BOCES is not always as advantageous. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And then my, oh, go ahead. Oh, you know what, um, I'm just kind of 
giving back real quick too, because Sandy had mentioned this at one point, and I'm kind of, and I think Paul has talked to me. You know how he's talking about a TOSA or something, and looking for that end of the support the CSE and that. We also it would either be that, and of course, I don't want to absorb it because at one point something came up about a, another point five school psychologist, but I don't I don't want to increase our staff because you know we have asked you every year, so I'm just letting you know. Hey, if the offer and we hit the lotto, I would take it. I'm not going to yeah. yell, but I'm trying to do that within. Um, because we did get that full-time social worker at the GLP in the elementary is a lifesaver. Holly Trito, it, it's just been a lifesaver. I've got Helen full-time up, you know, um, 6 through 12. But like Holly and I have been doing home visits. It's just awesome to have a social worker and Shannon, our full counselor at the two buildings. Because Shannon's doing all push-in now, um, mental health and all that whole program we spent a lot of money on. Uh, she's doing it in every single classroom. It's wonderful. It's just th that pupil personnel service part was so needed around here. And then Mrs. Feldman has been able to find money for the mental health training. We are pushing huge. Um, Joe, I, and Jen are going to get trained on another suicide program. Sorry. Because we really don't have a, a an intact response part. We deal with it day in, day out. But um, we're really looking at this program. But I appreciate the support I'm getting from you financially. That is our mission. That is our goal. Joe and I are both retiring next year. We want that in place so it sustains and that kids could be safe and staff can know what to do. We are doing another round of mental health first aid training, which is suicide prevention training. All my aides and nurses are coming in May 21st because we switched that day because of the calendar. Uh, the high school is almost completely trained, and then we'll start on the other two buildings. I think it's important to back up and say that that was one of those unfunded mandates. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the whole thing we have to do. Yeah. You know, Mrs. Klapp's got, you'll see the compute, all the stuff going out, so we have all our resources hooked on for families. It was, un and I appreciate getting the money for it because it's costly, you know. To, so I just want to let you know we're doing lots of stuff, and hopefully not a lot of money going into it but you never know who's going to show up at our doorstep any day in special ed no. so and with that being said the, the talk of not a lot of money I started to touch base with Sean before the meeting I think at some point we as a district and I don't want to step on toes I'm not it's just my observation as a parent and as an educator are going to have to start to take a look at the behaviors that we're dealing with um, this is not a dig at teachers. This is not a dig at I, what I'm seeing is really strong behavioral um, programs being put into place in classrooms, but the behaviors that these teachers are dealing with some days are in excess of what they can handle in a jet end setting. Um, my own children are being impacted by it um, in the sense that it's it's really taken away from what the nature of a gen ed setting, I think, should be. I don't know what the answer is. I'm not suggesting that we go out crazy and develop all these classrooms, but I think we have to maybe think of hybrid programs. If we start to, um, I think, cumulatively group enough kids where we're seeing, yeah, we have 10% of the second grade population is really demonstrating some significant behaviors. And this is not, I'm not talking mental health behaviors. I'm just talking about behavior. Behavior, no, no, it's not. And that's important to say. I, I think behaviors that we're, we're observing in classrooms, it, it's not an issue um, isolated in Eden. I think it's, it's systemic. I think it's the new trend. And I think it's the next thing we're going to have to tackle as educators. Um, it's alarming. It's something I think everybody should be concerned about because they're, it's not going away. It's not getting any better. I don't know what the answer is at this point. I just know that school districts have to deal with it. Um, and that's where we're at. We can't fix it until we get it. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do with these kids. But um, you know what, Jan, what's interesting, and I kind of know what you're talking about, is that 
the students with IEPs with behaviors, I have a lot more control. And mm -hmm. there's things that are going on. A lot of the things what you're talking about are gen ed students. Mm -hmm. um, and what's happening is nobody knows what to do with them, they're referred to us. So then we have to figure it out. So it just increases it. One thing down the road that districts are doing is getting their in-house behavioral specialists. Mm -hmm. Because when there's a crisis, they're calling me, or they're calling Joe, mm -hmm. and we're gonna only do so much, but maybe hiring or, you know, because you can contract through, um, contract through BOCES for a behavioral specialist, but they are so inundated, you can't even get them. No. We're on a waiting list for like a year, you know, to right. get support in there. But it's bigger than the picture, and it's about helping the teachers know what they can do. Mm -hmm. Helping the teachers, I mean, because we can't always be there to get them out, do this, do that. The teachers and need I to know. And I also believe that it's, it's a part of a, a parental support, too. Yeah, and, so, and we lack so that how many a lot. Years, right, so how many years ago was it when I'm going to say it was maybe in the 1980s that we were like, we have to bring social workers into school. That's mm -hmm. not what we were used to. But now we're absolutely looking on how to help parents manage their little ones so that their little ones can be better learners in school. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not even about being a learner. It's about sometimes just being civil. Well, they just can't right. even learn. Right. Civil. Exactly. Um, so I just, that's not something I'm looking to solve now, but I think it's something that we all need to keep. I mean, we talk about mental health, but you have to pull away from that because not mm -hmm. all of the behavior issues that we're seeing no. are mental health. Right. These are just kids who have... They're just behaviors. They're just behaviors. Yep. There's, there's no sense of boundaries and consequences, and, and it's trickling and snowballing as they get older and more hormonal. And That's why we put them into sports. Yeah. It fixes them. <laughs> Yeah, we're good. Run them ragged. Awesome. Hey, there, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, thank you. That thank was you. all I had. Thank you. Oh, I turned it on. Okay, now we're going to move on to the rest of the BOCES budget. As you had heard, um, the, my colleagues have already presented their areas of expertise. So one of the things you're going to notice in your printout is Last year we had some funds for the business office in the budget. What we did is we updated our 1980s accounting package to a new platform. It's the same vendor. We went from finance manager. We're going April 24th. We will go live with Envision. So those costs won't recur. And I helped Lucinda add some money to her costs because Envision carries an annual uh, fee associated with it that went over to her budget. So I like that because now it's no longer my problem. I gave it to Lucinda. You're welcome. So then we're going to go down and we're going to look. We went this year and it's the first time we've had a public information service. And what that is, BOCES has spent out a, sent out a specialist who comes one day a week, Carrie. She helps the superintendent and the staff with our Facebook page, our Twitter account, Instagram. And she helped some of the website as well. And the other thing she's found is she's found yet another way for us to use technology to reduce some of our advertising costs when we're going out to hire um, people or we're going out to advertise something where we would have to pay to put it in a paper. She's learning and looking at ways to help us cut costs there. So some of that, her salary will be aided, but some of that will also come back to us in savings that she is achieving in other areas of the budget. So then we're looking at our administrative costs, which we have no control over. That's BOZI's administrative costs. Those have gone up. And you see a huge reduction in the next line for special project costs. And that's because we've paid all of our money after the end of this year for the BOCES capital project. BOCES is unlike a school district where there's a vote in the public and it goes in your tax bill. What happens is the component districts vote and then they bill us each year for our portion, for the unaided portion. For, I believe it was three, maybe four years, we were billed our portion, and now we will be making our final payment this June. And then we had to add um, for workshops, we had them for the middle school. We didn't have anything for the middle school, and as we've set that up as a new building, it's important to prioritize and give those the same services as the high school and the GLP and the elementary school. And then you're going to look at our in-service training, and we're going to have to cut that some, as you can see. And that's just a budgetary cut because it's the least close to children when we cut that. 
And then we have a reduction in our occupational education because we have less students attending this year and we get billed for them next year. So overall, we're seeing our BOCES lines go down for these ones, $463,000. But the majority of that can be attributed straightly to not paying for the capital project. Do you have any questions? Just, just to be clear, the capital project for the four BOCES buildings, Hughes, Carrier, Ormsby, what's the fourth one, Paul? Hughes, Carrier, Luguitas, right. Not our capital project. Thank you, I didn't have that detail. I wasn't here when it came through. So if we're ready to move on, we'll look at the staffing presentation. And I've kind of broken this out into two areas because realistically we have our support staff and then we have our instructional staff. And so it's good for you to notice that we, per the board's recommendation, you wanted us, when we lost one of our cleaners, the comment was, the work task was unbearable, so we added another cleaner district-wide to help relieve so the buildings will stay clean and safe for our students. That position came in this year, but it wasn't in last year's budget, so I want to highlight that that is an FTE in included. And in the business office, I'm looking to help Sean next year. Yes, well, she's not. I'm not sure how happy she'll be, but we're looking to take some of the stack work that over the years has migrated over to her office and since she's talking retirement and its finances, I'm looking to bring the Medicaid and the stacks back into the district office and one of the superintendent's secretaries is going to take on some additional hours of 0.24 FTE to help with that. The other thing that we're looking at is we have a fitness center. We have a wonderful fitness center, 0.37 FTE each person for two people in order to man it so that the public, as per the promise when we did the capital project, so that we can have the support staff there so people can sign in that have signed up to use and done the waivers. Those are being handled through the business office. And then the support staff are sitting right there at the desk making sure the building is open, wiping down machines, making sure that if 911 were needed to be called, there's somebody there to help. So we're looking at our total support staff of 1.98 FTEs. That's less than two full people, but it's not two full people because it's various tasks around the district. Now we're going to talk about the instructional staff. And this Board of Education and Superintendent have made a promise to the community members of Eden to keep class sizes at a smaller level where the kids can get the individualized instruction and supports that they need. Everything that we've been hearing talked about tonight. So our, sixth gra our third grade, last year it was our second graders, we had a bubble and there was too many students. Well, we've been blessed with increased enrollment. So now we need a third grade teacher to move the second grade students up, but our first graders are filling what was in the third grade. So the bubble has continued, so we don't have any students that we're going to be removing from it. But we're going to need to add a third grade teacher. We're going to need to add a .03 for an art teacher, .15 for a science teacher to help support the special education department program. And then our technology slash business will go up .03 to support the third grade teacher. That being said, we also have a need to increase librarian staff. I'm not exactly sure where this is going to tease out in the end, but we're looking for a .25 of a person just to increase so that we can have additional library supports. So our total instructional staff are going up 1.46 percent or a total of 3.44 FTEs, which is a full-time equivalent for our new staffing requirements in the budget. Any questions? Well, so hopefully some of that fitness center will come back in, in revenue as well, too. But don't forget, there are a lot of people that are exempt from paying. So there's probably not going to be enough revenue to support that fully. Some. <laughs> yes, there will be some, but not enough to cover all of it at this point as we see it. But with a little bit of luck, that may change over the course of the um, ensuing summer. 
So now we're on to our benefits projections. So we're lucking out in the fact that the employee's retirement system, which you have to pay a certain percentage for every dollar of salary to support the New York State employee retirement system that our employees are members of. And so that rate went from 14.9 in 1819, and it's going down to 13.32%. Our teacher's retirement system, which is the same, but it's for the certificated staff and it's for the teaching staff, and teaching assistants are in it as well. And that's going from 11.4 cents for every dollar down to 8.86 cents for every dollar. So that we're getting some relief for the pension system costs. And of course, our FICA stays the same. Our workers' comp is staying stable. But our unemployment insurance, we are looking for an increase because New York State in October raised the maximum unemployment from $405 a week to $450 a week. So that incremental cost needs to go in the budget because if something were to happen and we were to have somebody that needed to be excised and laid off, we would have to be able to be able to afford the unemployment insurance. And in district, we don't pay, like an employer pays a percentage of all their salaries, similar to how we pay for our retirement system. In a school district, we pay 100% of the cost of any person who's eligible for unemployment who was our employee. So there's the difference, and that's why our number looks a little different, and that's why that is in effect to the district when they raise the maximum from 405 to $450 because we pay $450 a week if a highly paid person is laid off. And then we have our health insurance increases that have gone as well. And then um, our total with the ups and downs is 3.2% increase on our benefits. Do you have any questions? All right, thank you very much.